So I'm <clears throat> I'm Boris. Um, I've been I've been teaching. I've inherited this workshop. I don't know about like ten years ago, and I've been teaching it ever since. And it's it's grown. It's expanded initially. It was very statistics focused. Um, we quickly noticed that what you guys really need is not so much learning statistics, but learning to work with programs, with programming in principle, um, thinking about problems, structuring your problems, breaking them, them up into little steps, translating whatever you're doing in, and thinking about as workflow, translating that into working code, testing code, debugging it, applying sound software principles and all of that. So this is what we'll mostly be focusing on. Um, Oh, uh, by way of introduction, my, my original background is actually in, in medicine. I was, a, I was a young medical student at the University of Munich, um, went through all that, uh, graduated from medical school, got my license to practice and thought, what am I going to do with my life now? And, and um, I started looking at, 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 at a research laboratory and somehow ended up doing a PhD thesis in molecular biology. In, in real molecular biology. And um, I, I kind of got infected with the research virus. Um, that was so fascinating, trying to apply all your knowledge and your thinking to discover new things about the world. I guess I went into medicine simply out of curiosity. And I found that this curiosity was most satisfied um, in, 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 in research. And so since working days only have like 36 hours in which you can do stuff, at some point I had to make a decision whether to continue doing medicine or whether to continue doing research. So I've decided doing research. And um, after doing my PhD thesis um, in molecular biology, I did a, a post, a very wonderful time as a postdoc with, with Robert Huber in protein crystallography at the Max Planck Institute for Biochemistry in Martinsleet where we studied protein structure. So it got a little more uh, theoretical. And even though I've been programming for longer than before any of you were born, probably, um, I, I got to write some real code at that time um, in Fortran on, on, on very old uh, mainframe computers. Um, after that, um, looking at protein structure in more detail, I became interested in what makes proteins fold. Where is that information? How is that information even generated? How can we go from a linear gene and build a three-dimensional structure of something and magically have it self-assemble? What is the nature of that information? And so to, to pursue that a little further, that, that quest, that curiosity about the nature of information in, in life, um, I started getting into protein engineering. If we kind of think we understand what a protein is about, can we then swap out individual amino acids and make the protein perform something useful? And I applied a, <clears throat> a, a theoretical approach to that that I had developed, which is brutally simple, simply taking uh, sequences, uh, collecting statistics of homologous proteins, which amino acids appear in which um, position, and if the set of proteins is well chosen, you can approximate the distribution of amino acids at every position as a, as a canonical ensemble in statistical thermodynamics. So Boltzmann's law applies. You look at frequencies, and from the frequencies, you derive free energies. And that's a wonderful way to work. That's something that, that we, can, we can find all over nature and all over biology. The reason why it is so important and so useful to work um, with data, we can simply count occurrences. And if evolution is working and shaping the, the distributions, the profiles of how many things occur in which space, then that gives us an idea about a statistical free energy that's operating on the evolutionary, to, to be able to quantify the evolutionary pressure that's act, active on things. So this is what I was interested in. Um, in, in, in my uh, postdoc time in my first research group in, in, in protein engineering, 
And we actually learned how to stabilize proteins in a, in a very predictable way from uh, sets of homologous sequences. Um, based on that, I, I, was, I was recruited to come here to Toronto in 2001 to the University of Toronto, where I initially was uh, working very much on protein engineering and then kind of got more interested in the bioinformatics side of things. Um, as you know, the wet lab can be a bit frustrating. <laughs> Computers tend to be more reproducible, not less frustrating, but more reproducible. Um, so, so I got into that. Um, I started fo focusing more on, on bioinformatics teaching. I actually direct uh, the university's undergraduate specialist program in bioinformatics and computational biology. Um, <coughs> the, the teaching is, is is actually great fun because uh, it motivates me to not just focus on uh, the parts, the small parts of my domain that I'm interested in, but, but um, spread my net more widely, um, keeping abreast of current trends in bioinformatics, uncertainty in, in molecular biology and, and uh, molecular medicine. So that's the a journey of curiosity, taking me from medicine to molecular biology, from molecular biology to uh, biophysics and protein crystallography, from biophysics to protein engineering, from there to bioinformatics. And I've always joked if it gets any more theoretical than that, I'll be doing philosophy. But <laughs> um, last year, I, I actually started collaborating with philosophers on on uh, on a number of projects. Um, one the, on, on, the, on the biological side, something related to uh, systems biology, um, which is turning out to be quite interesting. So there you go. Um, now, most of what we'll be doing today is going to happen in an R project. And I, I desperately hope all of you have gone through um, the pre-work and have installed Git and R Studio and R on your computers. And in the pre-work, you've learned how to download um, an R project from GitHub. And you've installed a project folder on your computer. So the first uh, milestone of this course is to download the project for this course, which lives at on, on GitHub at, oh, I can, I can, I can just write it down here. So this lives on GitHub at uh, https github.com Hugin EDA, no, R hyphen EDA. So what you need to do is you need to open your R Studio, not navigate to that address. You need to open your R Studio. <coughs> You need to go to the menu File and choose New Project. Hang on. File, <coughs> New Project. Then you click on Version Control. Then you click on Git. And then you enter the repository URL, which is HTTPS. H Y G I N N. Thank you. Computers are picky about that kind of thing. R E D A. <coughs> the project directory name should autofill to R E D A. You need to browse on your computer to find the the project folder that you've created. And within that project folder, this, uh, the, your, your workshop folder, within that workshop folder, this project folder is going to be created if you click on Create Project, which I'm not going to do now because I already have it. And um, once you are done with that, the project should 
introduce itself, say welcome, and then ask you to type in it to set up this session. So type in it, and this will source and load some files from the directory. And if you are done with that, please put up a blue post-it, and if you, if you get uh, lost with that, please put up a red post-it. This is our first absolutely crucial milestone. see some people still working on that. If you're not actually still working on that um, and you completed it, but don't have your blue posted up, then do put your blue posted up so I know that everybody's on the same thing. Uh, Lauren, could you help Leon? Invisible posted. Any principal problem, Greg? Uh, no, just uh, my name is spelling. Spelling, yeah. Uh, it's one G, two N's. Aha. It does not work if you do two G's and one N. <laughs> In case you were wondering. As I said, computers are picky about that kind of thing. All right, good. So um, type init, this, this init function initializes a few things. Let's talk briefly about what's in the box of, of the projects. Our studio projects are supremely useful. I use them all the time. Um, this, this has really changed the way I work. So whenever I think about a data analysis question, I make a new R project about it. I start writing scripts and I put everything I do into that script. Um, a good setup is, is having a script where you actually have code, um, perhaps also storing I ideas about it in a, in a separate notes file, but um, just put everything into a script. The, even if you think you'll, you'll try out some things on the console, that's actually much less useful. Put it into a script load things from a script, it's much easier to edit and go back and to keep an overview of what you've been doing and um, perhaps even remembering 
things you've done before elsewhere and then copying code and, 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 and doing things. So <clears throat> this workshop will be um, almost exclusively driven from, from script files like that. Um, in, the work, in the introduction workshop that we went over the last few days, we had very little code actual code to work with in the files and, and our poor students had to write everything themselves. Um, in this workshop we'll be working with functions that are often a little more complicated and the point is to demonstrate how the function works um, basically as templates that you can use later on. So there's much more code in the actual examples which will then just be executing and, and, and going along. Um, <clears throat> right, we're, we're planning um, approximately five modules for this workshop. Uh, the code that we'll have posted by the end is pretty much self-contained, so if we don't get to cover something, you, can, you should be able to go through the code and, and work through it on your own, and you can also come back to it at any, any uh, time. <coughs> now, as um, I develop these things, I, I end up updating and changing things, um, not just at the last minute, but after the last minute and beyond. So this is something that's very often constantly in flux. It will keep on living at, at, at that site, but I'll update it from time to time. And when I update things, I use version control to commit the changes to my, my local uh, version control here, and then I push my changes to the master repository on GitHub. And then whenever something is new and ends up there, all you need to do is you need to load the project or be in the project and then say pull branches and that just pulls down the updated information uh, that you have. This is extremely useful and, and very quick to share code. If I you know, change a few lines in the scripts here, I can push it and then pull it back in. Now there's a, there's, there's a bit of a conflict. I don't think we figured out how to work with this optimally, but here, here's the thing. You need to write lots of comments into the code. Um, you need to experiment with things, try variations of parameters, uh, note down your ideas, and so on. Now if you do that and you save your changes, and then I update something, and you try to pull that down, Git is going to complain and say, whoa, we have a merge conflict here. Your local version is uh, has additional information <clears throat> which has changed uh, from the master copy up at GitHub. And if I just pull down that master copy version, we're going to overwrite your local changes, which may not be what you want. So this, this is why um, <clears throat> you should not be editing the files um, REDA, REDA regression, REDA introduction, REDA clustering, they're basically for you to read and work with. Now where do you put your comments then? Well, in the introductory workshop in the last two days, we made local copies of these files from the, from the setup script. And these local copies are then called, say, my REDA introduction. And you can copy these and work with them and save your changes and then if something gets updated I'm updating only this here and not the other copy so you're basically working with two sets of information the one with your local cop with your with your uh, custom notes and information and the one that comes down from github now there's a problem in that because that means um, your local copies are not going to have the updates that I put into the other script. So that doesn't work that well either. So in this workshop, we'll adopt a different strategy. So if you've been here the last two days, don't get confused. There's a file called myedanotes.r for you to write your general notes in. Um, this file does not live on GitHub. So anything that I do on, on GitHub is not going to overwrite this file. There's not going to be a merge conflict. Um, so put all your notes into, open your myedanotes.r, put all your notes into there, and let's see how that works. It'll require you switching 
uh, back and forth from um, <clears throat> um, back and forth bet between uh, these two tabs. In fact, in the RStudio interface, you can detach a file like this by just dragging down the tab. Hello. Oh, not you have to drag it out of the uh, RStudio window, and then you open it in a separate little window. So I don't know what's more useful, keeping it in a tab or keeping it in a separate window. Both are possible. Now, if you do want to edit one of the actual code files, um, you can do that, but then just save it under a different file name. So for example, if I do want to edit this here, I, I, I can put some edits in. Some comments. And then don't save it, but save it as whatever, for example, my r.eda. So you can do that. But note that these, these local versions are not going to be updated from, from GitHub. Confusing? I think I'm already confused. Are you confused? It gets worse. Um, keeping a journal. So for things that you write as, as code snips, as pieces of code, use this, this little file, my EDA notes. Um, if I develop things online, I'm always going to put this into this code snips file, which I'm going to update from time to time. So um, if we come up with particularly crafty solutions to some of the tasks which we're discussing, the code is going to be in here and then uploaded, and then you can copy it down and, and put it into your journal or, or where, wherever you want to keep it. Um, but in principle, you keep your notes in myedanotes.r. Um, but that's good for codes. Um, for ideas, for concepts, it may be much more useful um, to write them down by hand. So whenever I go to a lecture, I, I'm, I'm writing constantly all the time. Um, not so much because I need to, I'm, 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 I'm a slow learner and a slow thinker and I need to go back to my notes and reread what I've just heard in order to read it several times to finally understand it. The idea is, is more to use writing to use keeping a journal as a tool for focusing. As you write, you're sure, and, and you paraphrase what I'm saying, the concepts that I'm talking about, you can be sure that you're actually actively engaging with what I'm saying. It's not all just going uh, over your head and, and, and you're thinking very different things about the beautiful weather in Toronto and how nice it would be to visit the islands instead of being here. Um, so write. Write down all ideas, write down all concepts. This is, this is going to be very, very useful. Once again, this is not a course on the internet. You're here because we're here to explain things and provide you with insights and emphasis and background and context that you wouldn't find anywhere else. Share experience. So profit from that by writing it down. Keep a journal. I'm emphasizing this more and more in all of my bioinformatics courses now. Um, between 20 and 25 percent of the final grade, of the final grade, is given for student journals. That's not because, you know, I, I want to see what, what students um, write in their journals, but to emphasize to everyone that this is crucially important. You might have heard the term um, reproducible research. It's getting to be a more and more important thing, the, the fact that if we publish data, we're going to be more and more detailed in our requirements to uh, provide an exact uh, trace of where the data originated, how it was manipulated, where it went, and so on. 
And if you don't keep scripts and if you don't write down your ideas in journals, you're not going to be able to do that. I know that from experience. All right. So what's in the box? You have <clears throat> our studio here. As you know, there's by default four different panes open. Pain as in window pane, P-A-N-E, not as in uh, discomfort, P-A-I-N, even though the distinction in programming is sometimes not very obvious. The lower left one is the console. This is where we, we simply type single commands. The upper left one is the uh, script pane. <clears throat> this is where I do most of my work. This is where I write everything because um, it's very easy to transfer commands into the console, things like get wd. Um, if I type that into the script pane, how do I execute that? I do what? Control enter. What does? But but what and how? There's a, there's a, you're omitting a detail here. <laughs> okay, I'll type control enter. Nothing happens. I need to put my cursor into line 125 and then type control enter. That will execute the command. Get WD, which shows me the working directory. Right? So I can type this here and I can retrieve what I type in the history pane. And I can double click things I find in the history pane. I can even search in the history pane for commands that I, I issued ages ago. I can double click on something here, here, and that loads it into the console so I can then either execute the command again um, or I can edit it. But most usefully I put my commands into the script and execute them from there. <clears throat> um, If so, so what gets executed is a little bit dependent on, on scope. So as you've noticed, the cursor has to be in the right place. <clears throat> if I execute something simply having the cursor in a line, I'm actually executing the entire block. So if my block of an expression spans multiple lines, I will be executing multiple lines at once. So for example, um, I should put that in code snips. If I do some for i in uh, 1, 2, 10, no. All right, so what does this do? It's a simple for loop. Dan, what does this do? I've done tons of these yesterday. During every i from 1 to 10, you go by threes and print whatever it lands on and then also print the square of that number. OK, good. <clears throat> now, if I um, put my cursor in this line here and press Command Enter, I execute the entire loop. If I put my cursor in this line, 
I also execute the entire loop. Because basically the context is this an expression between the brackets. So I don't have to be in the first line. I just have to be in the right context for this entire enclosed expression here. Um, if I put my cursor in here, I just execute this one line. It's a different context. If, however, I select something, I execute only the selection. So, for example, I can select I, and that will show me show me what? If I press Control Enter, what do I get? Control Enter of I. The last value of I in the loop. Exactly, the last value of I, or I would say the current <laughs> value of I, which is the last value that it had when it went out of the loop. <clears throat> which is 10. And that's really useful because um, often we have uh, expressions in R where we have functions and parameters and functions as parameters of functions and, and complicated selections. And they're all evaluated from inside to out. So if I do something like that and I'm not exactly sure what I'm actually doing here and what this is, I can just select the sub-expression, press Control Enter, and then execute the selection alone. So this is the expression sequence 1 to 10 by equals 3, which gives me 1, 4, 7, 10. Which also shows you how the very, very versatile sequence function works from the first to the last, and then we can <coughs> increment things. There's, uh, just to note this here, um, there's two main important parameters for the sequence function. One is by. Default is 1. So if I just say sequence 1 to 10, it's the same thing as using the colon operator. By gives me larger intervals or smaller intervals. I could say something like um, 0.5. <clears throat> and there's also the possibility on specifying the length of the output, which we could somehow compute by hand. Say you want 21 values because you, you, know, you just need 21 equally spaced x values to plot something. Um, then I can specify, give me 21 values. I type the first three characters of the parameter. Our studio then tells me um, what parameter I can, I can put in there that begins with that. It also tells me what that parameter is, or if there are alternatives, what these are. So length.out is the desired length of the sequence, and it has to be a non-negative number. And so I press tab and then say something like 21. So then I get 21 elements. And the function automatically computes the correct increment, which I could do by hand, but I really don't want to because I would certainly mess up and need to debug it for half an hour before I finally get it right. OK, so that was an aside simply for executing commands. And you will be um, executing a lot of commands in the scripts. Put the cursor into the right scope, press uh, Command Enter or Control Enter, depending on whether you're on a Windows machine or in a Mac. That executes an entire block. Or if you want to be more specific, select something, do the same thing. It can be a multiple line selection or just part of a line, even just a single character. And um, that gets executed. Things that get executed appear in the history tab, if you should need it, um, you can recall things by double clicking. And then execute them in the console. <clears throat> but of course, you can also um, 
just use your arrow keys on the console and um, move up and down to recall commands and then you can edit them, edit them and, and, and change them and execute them again. So there's, there's many different ways. In principle though, um, the way I like to work is to put all the commands I use into my script and edit them there and save my script from time to time. Why did I get sidetracked with that? <laughs> Where was I coming from? I have no idea. Let's continue with discussing what's in the box. Okay, so the, f the first file here is git ignore. That's just a file that uh, tells what is going to go into updates. Uh, you don't even need that unless you are um, committing to your own repository. Um, what I usually do is, is just copy that from an older project. I don't want to keep our history files. I don't want to keep um, updates to um, the, uh, this, these are operating system specific files and so on. Um, let me say something about how this is configured with, with uh, our history and, and, and all of that. By default, in the project options, I've set up the project to not restore our data into the workspace, not to save the workspace, and not to always save history. Um, by default, these are on. I've just switched them off for this project. Let me explain briefly what happens here. So <clears throat> normally, by default, um, R would save the entire workspace to a file called our data on exit. So when you exit whatever you're doing, everything that's in your workspace is saved to this our data file. The our data file then contains everything that's here, the functions that you've loaded, the values that you've loaded, the objects that you've loaded, and so on. When you then restart R, <coughs> this gets reloaded, and um, you can continue working with the same workspace that you've used before. And just like that, you would agree that that's probably a very useful thing. But I say, no, don't do that. That's not useful at all. That's supremely dangerous that basically loads data into your R session from a source that you don't completely have under control. You don't remember if the data files that you have in there, are these the ones that are actually broken because um, you, you experimented with something that didn't actually work? Or is that the correct version? How do, you, how do you figure that out? So things can go subtly wrong if you make assumptions about the things that you load into your workspace. What you should be doing instead is recreating your workspace from scratch, from zero, with nothing loaded from your scripts explicitly. And in those cases where there's some very expensive calculations that run for hours and then create some intermediate data, save these intermediate files explicitly under a file name that you can recognize <clears throat> with a comment in your script what they contain and a version number and load them explicitly when you restart. I think it's a very unsafe principle. You know, th this, is, this is something that um, program, well, let me not talk about Microsoft programs. Um, <clears throat> it's a very unsafe principle uh, for, for computer programs to, to do things implicitly without you being under control. And, and knowing what goes on. The chances of you corrupting your data and doing something extremely wrong uh, are very high. On the R um, help mailing list, which I sometimes contribute to, we, we often have people saying help. Um, 
I'm, I'm starting R and it crashes as soon as I start it. Well, what usually happens is that there's some thing that's loaded which is incompatible with life on the computer as we know it. And um, it got saved into the R data file and now R loads it on startup and that crashes the program and, and that's not good. Um, solution, of course, is go to your project directory, delete that .r data file, and then basically start from a vanilla start. Better to not create it in the first place. So this is the thing about um, saving the workspace to our data on exit and restoring our data into workspace on the startup. I don't do that. It's switched off. Be careful. When you make your own projects, it'll be switched on by default. If you wish to turn them off, you'll have to do that uh, explicitly. It's kind of similar with the history file. Always to save history, even if not saving our data, I also switch that off. I don't need history files because I don't rely on the history which is stored. I rely on the commands in my script file. Everything is in my script file. That's where I can read what I've been doing. That's where I edit it, and that's where I pull it out. So very often, um, I open my, my, my project, I go to the main file that, that basically controls everything, and then I just click on source to put my program into a defined state and load everything that I want to do. Um, <clears throat> by default, R, however, loads a file that's, that's actually quite useful, which is called R profile. So this R profile is an R script which gets loaded and executed when you start, uh, when you reload your project. It's a, it's a little bit more involved. Actually, what happens is if you start R in a particular directory, um, the R profile file in that directory is going to be executed. Um, but in this case, if you work from a project, that's the project working directory. Oh, initially, I've also set up the projects um, to have the working directory as the project di directory. So before saving everything, I made sure to set working directory to the project directory. And even though my project directory is named different, this seems to be transportable in the sense that your working directory is now also the, the project directory. So our profile. Our profile contains um, just two things, um, a function definition and printing some output, not using the print statement, but the cat statement, which is kind of like print. It means concatenate. It doesn't tell you to print kitten. But um, anyway, this created the startup message, welcome, and type in it to set up the session. When you then typed in it, um, it sourced a file of commands that is also not general to R, but unique to the way that I've set up uh, projects. So this dot init dot R contains some initialization code which is a bit specific to the way that we run workshops here. Um, <clears throat> it does two things. First of all, it sources local functions. And it tells you, I'm sourcing local functions from the R directory. And then it uses the function list files with the path of the R directory in the files here. And this is a, a, a Unix convention of how to specify relative paths. So if I'm in the local directory, um, anything within that directory is a single dot. Anything in the directory above is just two dots. You actually see the two dots here. If you, if you click on that, you go to the directory above, to your, your workshop directory. Um, so this means 
in the local directory and in a, in a sub-directory or file which is called R. So this identifies the R folder in which I want to list files. The pattern that I'm applying here is all files that end with a dot R. This is a regular expression. We'll be talking about regular expressions a, a, a little later. So from the, from the directory here, all files that end with R, and um, don't give me just the file name, give me the full name, i.e. the full path with that. So the R directory contains three files that end with R, bycode, object info, and readfastA.R. So this expression, list files, path, pattern, and full names, generates a vector of three file names. And then I put that vector into the, into the um, condition for a for loop. So this is my, my, my vector here. <clears throat> and then I iterate my loop over this vector. And for every iteration, I assign one element from the vector to a variable called script. So this for loop iterates three times. And in the first time, the script variable is our bico.r. The second time, the script variable is our object info.r. Third time, it's readfastday.r. And then the command source script actually runs that script. Now, what's in a script like that? Everything that I put into the R folder is, is a script that can load one or potentially more functions. So readfastday.r is a function file. Um, it has a header, some information about the version, um, its purpose. It describes the parameters. Um, for example, the parameter fn that's loaded here is a character variable, the file name of the input file. Um, it has a single return value, i.e. here, a character vector, which are single letters of a fast A sequence, and um, then the actual function code. So <clears throat> this is the function that's loaded here. And as I source the file, that function is known and enters into the workspace. So this is one way of initializing my, my workspace flexibly with functions that I keep in my R directory, which are utilities for the project that, that I, I want to use here. Um, OK. Um, and then <clears throat> in my function files, but this is optional. You, the function will work perfectly without that. In my function files, I also put two blocks of um, utility code. One has examples with which I can remind myself of how I intended to use this function. It's kind of like the example section in an R help file. And um, one has tests that I can, I can use to make sure if I change something in my function, uh, I can then run the tests and make sure that all the output is still correct the way that I intended it to. <coughs> which I'm skipping here. We'll, we might talk a little bit about, about testing later on. Now, for those of you who, who are here for the first time, um, we've already discussed this in, in the last workshop, but this, this is a bit of an odd construction, isn't it? If false, why? What does that do? If false. If is a conditional expression, but what does if false do? And why am I putting things like, you know, actually testing or my, my usage example in, the, in an if block with if false? What do you think? Um, 
from when you source this file, I won't exactly do the lines, but you can still do those examples for later. Exactly right. So when we source this file, everything in there is not going to be executed. A conditional expression is executed if the condition is true. So we usually put some test into the condition, if length greater than zero, or if number of files is exactly 25, or if expression value equals 100, something like that. And then we, we, we execute our, our conditional expression based on that. But it gets executed if it's true. Now, if I write explicitly false, this means it can never be true. It's never executed. I'm writing a block of code that is not executed. Why that? Well, when I source this file, I don't want this to be executed every single time I start up my project. But I still want the code. Because when I edit my file and I change my usage examples or I, write, I finally get around to writing my tests, um, I put that code into there. And then I can simply, I can simply um, go into here and, and you know, execute this line by line, <clears throat> define myself a file, um, write some lines into, into this temporary file, um, and use the read fastA function and uh, check that it actually works. But that doesn't always happen when I source the file because I'm, I'm hiding it from execution in this block here. So this is, this is the way I, I, I kind of tend to set up my, um, my R code. Uh, write single functions into files, put them into the R directory, um, be a little bit ob obsessive about actually writing what the purpose is, actually writing about what the parameters are expected to be, actually writing out what the results is. Um, in these simple examples, it's easy to remember. In more complicated examples, you won't remember, and it will be tearing out your the person half a year you yourself half a year from now when you've forgotten what you were doing at that time is going to tear out their hair and curse past you because you didn't write comments and you didn't write uh, proper function headers. So don't be that person. Um, comment your code. And um, if you think this is useful and you want to adopt it, there's a function template here which you can just copy and paste or uh, save as now, notice that this has nice syntax coloring. Um, the function template does not. That's because it doesn't have a dot .r extension. So R doesn't actually, RStudio doesn't actually recognize this as an R script file, even though it is. Um, and I, I did that because, um, well, the init code just picks out everything with the extension r. And if I call this function template.r, it'll get executed upon startup. So I was thinking for a while, should I special case this and just remove this from the list or call it differently? You, you have to balance your options sometimes. One of the two should happen. I don't want to execute this function template, but I can, I can put a little bit of a special case here and say, if my file name is function template, don't source it, or I can just name this in a different way. I, I think this is slightly more general. Special casing code, um, if you ever find yourself doing an analysis and, and needing to write special cases to handle odd situations, um, maybe it's time to step back and think in a more principled fashion about what your code does. It, it's, it's usually more of a, a symptom of bad concepts than of something that you actually need to do. <clears throat> so that was the init function and how all of this works. Um, there are – yeah, I think we'll get to everything else as we, as we go along. Oh, oh just uh, uh, the scripts folder. 
um, has some scripts to be working with, and it, it similarly it has a script template. Um, you could you could use this as a template to set up your own project scripts at home. Uh, there's a header there, setting purpose, version, date, author. Uh, usually we start scripts by setting the working directory to whatever your project directory is if it's not automatically loaded that way. Loading packages. Oh, let me say something about you. You, you will maybe encounter this idiom about loading packages. I use that quite frequently. Um, I think I've discussed this in the, in the preparatory workshop, but it's worthwhile mentioning here because it, it could look confusing. Um, <clears throat> When you load a package from, from CRAN for the first time, you have to install it on your computer. That's extremely well done and extremely valuable. Um, the people working for the CRAN or Comprehensive R Archive Network or for Bioconductor are extremely knowledgeable and extremely fastidious in making sure that only tested, validated code that actually works and that doesn't install ransomware on your computers uh, is shared from the networks to, to researchers um, everywhere else. So um, CRAN and, and Bioconductor are extremely useful. There's a l literally thousands of useful packages there, but you need to install them on your computer to extend R and to customize it for, for functions, and we'll be, we'll be doing that quite frequently. Now, after you've installed them, they live on your computer. <coughs> and um, you need to load a package every single time for a new R session. RStudio allows you to do that from the packages window. So we can, you can scroll through the packages that are available on your computer. Um, and if you check one of the check marks, that package is, is automatically loaded with the library command. So <clears throat> I need to install a package, and then I load it as a library. Now, these are scripts that I source. And I might source them every single time I start up my project. So if I put install packages and then library into my script file, I would be accessing the internet and potentially downloading a few 10 megabytes of data every single time I, upload my, I, I run my script. That's not a good way to work. So we use a different paradigm instead. There's another function which is very similar to library. It, it actually does almost exactly the same thing, loading an existing package. It's called require. So require loads packages just like library does. But require has a return value. The return value is a logical value. And the logical value is true if the package was successfully loaded, and it's false if it was not successfully loaded. And most commonly, the reason why it was not successfully loaded was that it did not exist on the computer. So what we do here for running the scripts is we say require seek in R. Um, if seek in R does not exist, this will return false. The exclamation mark in the conditional expression here turns that false into a true. And then the contents of this if expression, the conditional expression, is executed, which says install it and then load it. So again, in this way, I keep my scripts from doing things when I source them doing things that I don't want them to do. But I can, I can, I can make sure that uh, everything that I need is actually there. So if, if I execute this, um, all that happens is not very much, but um, the, the package seek in R is, is now loaded. So it will only load, like, what if you have it installed? Will it, it just automatically load it then? It will. If I run this, this uh, if I source the script, if I have it installed, it will get loaded, and then the commands are available. Um, but that will already happen through the require command. So I don't even use the, the library command at that okay, point, like but the require, require command. Does that. 
Yeah. Right. But in that way, when I source my script, I don't install the package new every single time. Another way to possibly write this is to do it in the following way. Just comment out the install packages, but keep it there. Thus, again, um, <clears throat> if you run your, your, your script, this is not happening. Um, if the package doesn't exist, um, your script will stop working at that point. If you go through it, it will complain that the package doesn't exist. And um, you can then do it manually. So this required thing is a, is a way to do it automati automatically, but um, you can just write it manually. The point that I'm making, though, is, is don't put this expression into your scripts that you source frequently, because that will install the package every single time, which is probably not what's intended. I think that that kind of covers um, what's in the box here um, and how it works. If anything about that is not clear, um, do let me know. It's, it's kind of uh, um, useful. It, it captures a lot of experience on how best to set up projects and, and to work with them. So um, maybe that's also going to be something useful for your own work later on. Now, good, we have some time before the coffee break. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> now, let's, let's get started with some actual work with R and exploratory data analysis. And, um, these, this is the file reda introduction.r, and we'll work with that. So once again, um, try not to edit this file. If you do edit this file, save it under a different file name. We're, we're going to um, update it later on. <clears throat> now there's some files that are specific to this, to this particular module, not just in general. In the assets folder, we have um, two papers. And these two papers are, you know, the project lives on GitHub, but these papers are not um, available for, um, as, as open source, so I can't just put them on GitHub like that. I've put them into a zip archive instead. Um, so if you double click this paper to open it, the zip archive will ask you for a password. What's the password? <laughs> well, you don't know, right? But you yeah. guess. So what, what do you think the password would be? What would be your first guess? <laughs> Not password. No, that's the name. Never. That's me. More of one, I don't. Know. But it's a little, it's a little more specific than that. Fort memorable CBW. So just type CBW. <coughs> And this opens a paper <clears throat> very cool. It's actually almost ancient in the field, like, wow, four years old. Do we even look at papers that are older than six months? But it's very nice. Chaitin et al. Massively parallel single cell RNA seq for marker free decomposition of tissues into cell types. Um, one of the first papers that actually used single cell expression analysis to do something useful with it. 
And we'll look at a few things, um, a few data uh, sets that were covered by that. Oh, which reminds me, Anne, when, when, when this gets edited, could you take the little thing from the, from the recording out where I actually tell them what the password is? <laughs> 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 just, just blank that. Because, you know, this is a science paper and we, sh we shouldn't just hand it out to people. Um, no, it's on it's it's on science. Yeah. So if well for us, yes, from the U of T library system, it is. Aren't they public after six months or a year now? Yeah, it does say open access right on the paper. It does say on open the, access right on the, on the, the paper. Bar and line yeah, the line. NIH push they all they all go open access. After. But I accessed it this morning and it wanted a subscription. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Weird. Well, try it. <laughs> anyway, you have it here. Uh, we'll look at it a little more later on. So that's um, the Haitin paper. There's another paper beyond bar charts, which is which is interesting to read. Um, this is basically um, additional information. If we have checkpoints and everybody's, well, most people are still caught up with doing something and you're already done and you're getting really, really bored, uh, you can look into that paper. I'll, uh, but I'll say more about that. There's a couple of data files which we will be using for, for tests. Um, <clears throat> we'll be working with the file uh, object info dot r. I've already mentioned function template um, in the r folder, and in the script folder, uh, there are two files: plotting reference and r programming regex, which are also kind of background information <coughs> which we load. Um, there's the script template that I noted, and there's a file called unit testing dot r. So, so these are specific. So while you're waiting for others to finish a checkpoint, here are some suggestions. So you can read the paper by Weisgaber at all beyond par charts. It's, it's, got, uh, it's also a password protected zip um, with the same password. And you can write yourself a little R script and start trying to work out how to implement the suggestions that are made in this paper, which are good, uh, as an R function. It's kind of different from what your default um, options to plot things in bar charts or in block box plots are. Um, but from things that you've learned in the workshop, you should be able to implement what, what they suggested. Uh, you can also study the test that package. I don't think we'll have time to really go through test that uh, to write tests. Um, <clears throat> but it should be said that for any kind of reproducible research, um, it's not just important to write code, it's important to make sure that your code actually does what you think it should be doing and to test that and to validate that. And um, the proper way to do that is to write a number of tests that you just have available with your code and that you can run and that you execute every single time that you change something in your code to make sure that you've not inadvertently broken something. In particular, if you do find a bug in your code at some point, you write a test that would have discovered the bug had you realized the situation earlier on. So that's a really, really sound principle on how to continuously maintain your code. You work with it, you might find a bug or you might add functionality, and when you do that, you write a new test for it which, which covers the new situation. <clears throat> um, yeah, this is, this, is, this is going to be very helpful. How to use that and using uh, test that is, is explained a little uh, in more detail in the script unit testing dot r, um, which you can work through in the downtime while you're waiting for other things. And you can also work, or sh should at some point, work through the script in rpr regex dot r. We're going to use regular expressions from time to time, um, basically just in the very most basic version. Regular expressions are really, really, really important. Um, they have a bit of a learning curve. Once you, once you get through the first obstacles, um, you, you, you can't understand how you could ever live without regular expressions. They're, they're so useful. 
Um, so, so get familiar with regular expressions. We're not going to do too much with regular expressions, just a little bit in this workshop, but a lot more is said in that script which is here for your enjoyment. So let's, let's start seeing if we're all set up. Um, typically, um, we'll have these commands here in, in, the, in this working script. Um, execute get working directory. It should be the directory that you recognize as your workshop directory and the project directory. Um, if we list files, we should be seeing um, <coughs> we should be seeing um, the file names of all the files in that we also see in the files pane. Do we see that? Is that correct? Are all the files there? Asna, do you see all the files when you execute the command that you also see in the files pane? No, I think I'm missing the regression. You're missing the REDA -E regression? Yeah. I see that here. Oh, but you don't have that. Yes, 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 because it's, it's, it's not uploaded to the project org. It's just something that, that lives in my folder. But there's, a, there's another difference. You don't actually get all the files? I don't actually get all the files. Which ones are missing? Non-R files and things in subdirectories? Well, um, there's a f I get the... Right, so I don't get the things in the subdirectories. This is not recursive. I don't remember. Does uh, list files even have a recursive option? What do I mean by recursive option? An option to have it go down and descend into subdirectories as well. I don't know. Um, list dot files. <coughs> Path, pattern, all files, full names, recursive, logical. Well, that's nice. And by default, recursive is false. is true. Now I get all of my files. And what's also nice is that by default I actually also get the full path with them. Okay, I didn't know we can do that. Nice. Um, anything else that's missing? What about in it? Not here, isn't it? In it? Why? Right, it starts with a dot. In most operating systems known to man, file names that start with a dot are not displayed in the directory by default. These are hidden system files and your operating system doesn't want you to see them, not because they're frightening, but because you might be tempted to edit them and that's generally not a good idea. Our studio is an editor designed to edit things and to touch things and to change them. So it would have be kind of, you know, ridiculous if it wouldn't show you all the files that exist so you can, you can access them and change them and edit them and hidden files and directories appear in your file pane. But by default, you don't list files that start with a period. And if you do want them, You have to specify all files is true. This is a logical value. If false, which is the default, 
only the names of visible files are returned. If it's true, all file names will be returned. Oh, I've already got that example here. So list files, all files are true. It shows me all the hidden files. First hidden file is a single dot, which just means the path to my local directory. The second hidden file is a double dot, which means the path to the directory, which is the parent directory of the local directory. Then I have DS store. This is something that um, my Mac <coughs> produces whenever I change file contents. Um, now, our studio doesn't show me that. It actually hides this .ds store. There's .git, which is a folder which contains um, the Git project information. Again, our studio hides that from me. It says you have no business going into that folder, which is very good. We don't. You never want to touch um, your version control parameters. Git ignore is a file that that can and should be edited. It's all the files in your directory that should not be under version control. And then there's init.r, our profile, the R project itself, and so on. So when I said our study shows me all the files, that's not entirely true. It, it shows me, it does not show me some of the files that it's pretty confident about that I, I should not be touching and, and messing about. Um, <clears throat> question? Yeah. Can I tell which files are on our Git version control versus those files that are just local? Because it would be important, right? Because as you said, I don't want to change anything that's captured by your version control. So could mess up your... You don't actually... Hmm. How do you do that? In, in principle, what you can do is simply go to commit in the version control. And this <coughs> will list all the files that are not up to date. Everything that's not listed in here is actually under version control. So you can't directly list the files that are under version control, but you can do the opposite. By just going to the commit pane, you will see everything that is not under version control because everything that is under version control was downloaded from the master file and is up to date unless you edited it. If you did edit it, it will have a little M icon for, for modified. <clears throat> These files here in yellow never got under version control. That's because I have them on my computer, but I never committed them. But you know, don't be frightened by that. I'm, I'm, I'm basically just mentioning this, um, this under version control and that there will be conflicts to prepare you. If you do edit something, there will be a, you know, a warning message and R will stop doing what you want to do. It will just give you a warning message and at that point we, we just need to recover. Okay, similar to list files, we can have list directories. Um, now, before we can actually get into exploratory data analysis and talk about why this is so much fun and how this is really cool, we first need to load some data. And there are these days so many different uh, data sources, the web, either from <clears throat> large databases that, that are gentle and, and well-behaved and, and offer you data for download in, in uh, easily understandable and well-defined formats, um, or things that just appear somehow oddly on web pages and you need to uh, go through convolutions to, to get them from the web page. Um, text files, uh, very many um, very much data is um, in Excel spreadsheets. Um, anybody here who, who does not use Excel spreadsheets? 
see everybody. It's so ubiquitous. Um, actually, the, one of the files that we will be working with here is, comes from an Excel spreadsheet on the supplementary data of the uh, Haiti et al. paper. So we'll, we'll <coughs> explore some data from the supplementary material published with this <coughs> relatively recent paper on single cell RNA-seq analysis. So unzip the Haiti et al. paper, have a look what the paper is all about, uh, orient yourself a little bit, it's, um, it's quite interesting not very involved. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we get the data into R and, and get things from text files. At least one person in the room who actually works with blood? Right. Two. Three. Okay. Uh, did you know this paper? Uh, yeah. 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 But I'm, I'm not really familiar with it, but um, I'm familiar with the author's papers. Okay. Great. So um, um, I'm going to rely on you. Whenever I say something wrong, then just speak up and correct me about this. So this one is? They both are. Yeah. Oh, both of them are open access? Oh. Well, that's fantastic. Okay, so, so we, can, we can just change the zip files thing and I'll, I, I'll just keep them as they are. Good. Um, <coughs> Right, so data comes from very, very different sources. What, something that, that I'd like to, to uh, focus on is uh, a list of gene names that we find in this figure here and talk about, you know, if we, how, how do we get something like that in R? There's a list of gene names, we find it in a paper, how, how do we get it into R? Well, if we're lucky, that list appears somewhere in the supplementary material, and we can download it. Um, in this case, we're not lucky. It's not there. Um, if we are lucky and the authors are our good friends, uh, we might get that list in an email. I didn't ask them. I probably would have gotten it, but I didn't ask. Um, <clears throat> now, this is a PDF file. Sometimes we can copy things from PDF files and then paste them. So can I copy this here? Nope. Why can I not copy this here? Well, because this is not actually text, it's an image. So at that point, they've produced an image and I'm stuck. There's no real good programmatic way to get that data. So what I ended up doing is uh, I made a screenshot of this, um, selected only this text, and ran it through a program for OCR, Optical Character Recognition. <laughs> Lo and behold, um, Almost 10% of the genes that I got from optical character recognition were even correct. <laughs> the rest had errors. So just as a practical thing, if you, if you have a list of text um, and you need to scan it, whether it's correct, how do you do that? A 
the reference set. Right, the reference set is in that image here. So I have, I have text in, in my text program and I have this reference set. And now I need to compare whether what I have in my text file is the same thing that appears here. How would you do that? Just go line by line? <laughs> Ask your grad student to do it. Yeah. Send it out to Amazon. Uh, the, do they call it, still call it the Mechanical Turk? So for, for very little money, you can actually have humans do tasks like that. Um, if, you, if, you have, if you do that several times and then um, average the results, you'll, you might get very high quality data. If this is a very large list, you, you don't do it. You actually do contact the authors. But for a small list, have your computer read it out to you. You can listen to what your computer reads, and then you can, you can uh, check it against what you see. And that's a much better way to, to approach this um, than just to try to visually match column by column and, and, and compare that. Anyway, so I, I, I went, I did that. The file <laughs> exists uh, for you to use. It's in data figure three characteristic genes dot text. If you do find an error in that, um, no, I'm not going to buy your beer. That's not that valuable. <laughs> but, but do let me know. And um, that's that data file. So our first task is open this text file here and get this into a vector in R. So this is now a text file. We want it in a vector. We want a vector that has one element for every single gene that is mentioned in this text file. So is there a good way to do this by hand, like copy and paste it? Possibly, think about it. Um, is there an R function to do this? Possibly, I don't know. Um, can you write a function? Possibly, no, not possibly. You can always write a function. So yes, you can do that. Do you have to? Well, we'll, we'll talk about that. So, scenario is you got a text file like that. It has gene names, <coughs> potentially many gene names, your collaborator sent it to you a day before going on holiday. You, you can't get it into a, into, a, into a better version, and now you have to read it into R somehow. If you're done and you know how to do this, you are allowed to peek into the file sample solution read text.r in the sample solutions folder. If you're not done yet, do not peek. That would defeat the purpose. If you're stuck, put up a red post-it. If you're done, put up a blue post-it.
sweet tempers. <laughs> or even just this. So I need the quotes. That's it does matter. I want a vector. Oh, in this case, the specification calls for a vector. So maybe we can we can quickly and, and jointly look at the options we have here. So we have a vector of we have a, 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 some strings that we pick up from a text file, potentially a large text file, and we want to get this into a vector. Canonically, we get elements into a vector by defining a variable name or. something like my v, assigning something to that variable, and that something that we assign has to be a vector. And typically, we <coughs> compose vectors in R with the C operator, unless we use functions that have, um, that actually produce vectors as the output. But if we assemble vectors by hand, we use this, the, uh, the C function. So now I need to get these things in, into here. So I could just paste them in here, but that would not be uh, legal R. That will generate an error about unexpected symbols. Because um, R expects that there ought to be um, there ought to be commas that separate the elements. So let's put in some commas. OK, so I have some commas. And then I could do this. And now I get a different error. The error I get now is object CD19 not found. That's the kind of error that I've seen a lot in the last two days. What does that tell me? And it should tell you, read your error messages. They actually often tell you something useful. Not always, but often. So what does object CD19 in that context mean? It's not interpreting it as a string. Right. It thinks this is a variable name. Yeah. It thinks it's a variable name that identifies an R object. And um, it complains because, you know, I never defined a variable by that name. Nor did I want to because I don't mean that this, this one to be a variable. So um, I want it to be a string. How do I turn something like that into a string? Quotation, quotation marks, right? So I define this with quotation marks. Now, <clears throat> if I double click it, I select the entire word. Then if I just press a single quotation mark, R actually, our studio gives me both quotation marks. So many of the characters operate for matched pairs around selections. Single quotes do that, double quotes do that, parentheses do that, square brackets do that, and curly braces do that too. That's very useful. And lo and behold, I get my vector. My V is now a five-character vector uh, that contains CD19, CD179, B, and so on. So for five gene names, this is not too bad. How many before I go crazy? 100? Depends how desperate I am. My limit's like 10. Your limit would be 10? Yeah. That, that kind of makes sense. So is there an easier way? Well, that depends. Um, <clears throat> I have a few 
sample solutions here adding it element by element that's what it would look like actually I've done this here oh my god <laughs> <laughs> um, you could also en enter it by hand all at once so <clears throat> we can just define a single string which contains all of these simply by copying just you know writing something like s and then uh, quotation marks and then taking the whole thing copying it pasting it in here and pressing return so that now is a string <clears throat> which internally has CD19 line break, CD79B line break, CD22 line break, and so on. So it has what I need, but it's separated by line breaks within a single string. And I can use the functions, the function which to separate it. Everybody who is here, yes, who was here yesterday, knows that I'm talking about the function <coughs> strsplit. <laughs> strsplit. So I can str split my S and I have to define what I am splitting on and that's line breaks. <clears throat> and I get something very similar without the need to identify every single word. Or I can use the read lines function and this produces a vector of strings or I can use other functions which might produce data frames. Why did you have to use unlist? Um, ah, why did I have to use unlist? Oh. Jennifer, why are we using unlist? I don't remember. <laughs> you don't remember. Anybody remember? Okay, so strsplit is a vectorized function which can operate on many strings. And the way that I've called it, I've just used on one string of words separated by line breaks. But it can operate on many strings. Now the output of doing it on one string is a vector of a certain length. If I use this on a different string, and my vector has a different length, the output is going to be a vector of a different length. So then I need to somehow put vectors of different lengths together. And I can't do that in a matrix, because in a matrix, rows and columns have to have the same size. Um, I can't do that in a data frame, because same thing. So I need to put things into a list. In a list, I can do that. So what string split does, it operates on the first argument, puts the result into a list, it operates on the second argument, puts the result into a list, and so on. If I give it only a single list, uh, a single argument, like the string I had, the result is going to be a list, a single item, which is the vector that I need. So the vector that I need is contained within a list, and I need to get it out to be able to work with it, and this is why I tell it to unlist. Alternatively, <coughs> I could have written this, i.e. pulling out um, the first element from the list, which is the vector that I need. So I sometimes use one code idiom and sometimes I use two code idioms. Um, the differences are a little subtle, but, but for our purposes, uh, both of these work equally. Right? So, sirsplit creates a list. I need to get the results out of the list. 